I'd like to start today with a question. What were you doing 25 years ago? What were you doing 25 years ago? There's some of you who weren't here 25 years ago. Uh, most of us were here 25 years ago, and I think we would say that a lot can change in 25 years. And 25 years ago, Jane and I lived in Cincinnati. We had just uh, recently bought our first home. We didn't have any precious daughters yet. We had a dog, a small toy poodle by the name of Sharky, and he was my world at the time, besides Jane, of course. And we, Jane and I both had a wonderful head of hair. A lot has changed in the past 25 years and I'm sure you can say the same. And again, some of you who are not even 25 can't say that, but we're grateful you're here. Welcome to the world. All right. So 25 years ago is going to be kind of our time frame that we're going to focus on. Because the Apostle Paul is writing the letter to the church in Philippi. And that's what we've been studying to this point. We actually arrive at chapter 3 today. And... He is going to refer back to a period of time that was approximately 25 years earlier where he had a different set of priorities. He had a different focus and pursuit in life. And for Paul, a lot changed and it had nothing to do with a house or hair. His completely changed from being Saul, who persecuted Christians, to become Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, a leader in the church. The power of Jesus, where the old is gone and the new has come. You see, Paul is going to refer back to what he pursued and thought was gain, and after Jesus it became garbage because nothing compares to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And some of you would say amen and amen to that. Well, Paul is going to talk about that. And what I'd like to do is kind of set the stage for us to be able to understand that before Paul wrote this letter, as an apostle, a leader in the church to a church in Philippi, 25 years before that, he would go into homes and he would take men and women to prison for torture and execution because they were followers of Jesus. He was a Pharisee by the name of Saul. And we see in Acts 8, 3, that Saul began ravaging. That is a strong word ravaging the church by entering house after house on behalf of the Jewish leaders and the high priest, Jewish high priest at that time. He was the greatest enemy and persecutor of Christians. But then Jesus changed everything. We're going to see a brief video from a series we did a couple years ago that just kind of outlines this for us. The series was the story and this is the story of Saul to Paul. The disciples, now called apostles, began teaching in the Jewish temples. This angered the religious leaders. Several times they beat up the apostles and threw them in jail. One religious leader in particular, named Saul, was determined to destroy this new movement of Jesus' followers. So he went from house to house in the region and arrested those claiming to follow Jesus. Then one day, while Saul was walking down the street, a bright light from the sky flashed. As he fell to the ground, he heard the voice of Jesus speaking to him. Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus commanded Saul to get up and go to the city of Damascus. Saul got up, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see. With some help, Saul traveled to Damascus where he met a man named Ananias. Ananias placed his hands on Saul, and something sort of like scales fell from his eyes. Suddenly he could see again. Ananias told him that Jesus had orchestrated all of this 
so Saul could receive the Holy Spirit. This experience completely changed Saul's life. He became a follower of Jesus. Soon, Saul would set out on an extraordinary journey to tell others about Jesus. Saul was going to Damascus to persecute Christians. That's why he was going. And Jesus supernaturally met him on the road to Damascus and changed his life. Changed his life. He temporarily became blind and he went to Damascus. And Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus, shared the hope of Jesus. Saul gave his life to Jesus Christ. He was baptized and there in Damascus, like shackles on his eyes fell and he began to see, but this time he saw differently, saw spiritually because Jesus had changed his life. That is the power of Jesus Christ that what was old can become new. Who we were can become new through the power of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see Paul talk about, in verses 1 through 11, of the things that he used to completely pursue and count as his value and his identity. As a religious leader, it was all about fulfilling the law. It was all about fulfilling all of the rituals and rules of the Jewish faith, which were good. God established those but they were temporary as they were to point to our need for a savior and that savior is Jesus. But we're going to see how Paul realized all those things that he prioritized and valued, all those things that he pursued to make him right with God, that Jesus fulfilled all of that. But also I want us to see and ask ourselves the question, what are we pursuing in life as our greatest value? that we need to actually set aside to make Jesus our greatest pursuit. Because Paul has said clearly, knowing Jesus is greater than anything else in this world. And for some of us, we have to be able to weigh out what is of greatest value, what gives us worth, and we need to realize that it is empty unless the answer is Jesus. So let's go ahead and look at these verses. We're going to look at Philippians 3, 1 through 11, and we're going to really uncover what are some false places of confidence, and we're going to reveal what is our true and only place of confidence. Philippians 3, 1 through 11. This is what Paul said. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable. He's looking back 25 years earlier. I thought these things were valuable. But I love this. This is what he says next. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. 
I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Again, Paul is saying, yeah, I fulfilled the Old Testament law to every detail. But that did not make me righteous. That did not make me right with God. That was a temporary plan that pointed to Jesus and only Jesus could fulfill. And he said, all of that, I consider it lost to gain Jesus. But then he, the whole reason, let me set the context of why he is focusing on all of this. It was because there were a group of people who were Gentiles and converted to Judaism. The Old Testament law, they converted to Judaism. And they were coming and they were bringing this false teaching upon this church that Paul loved. They are the dogs in this, okay? They are the people who are doing evil. The evil that they were doing is they were saying, yes, we believe in Jesus, but you also need the law. Yes, we believe in Jesus, but you also need your works to fulfill the Old Testament covenant. And Paul's like, no, I've done all of that. And all of it was pointing to Jesus. And the only thing that matters is Jesus. For them to go back to trying to gain righteousness through the law was for them to reject the grace of God and the power of Jesus that fulfilled the law. And so he is pleading with them and saying, look at my life. 25 years ago, I did all that. I was at the top of all of that. And all of that compared to Jesus is garbage. Because Jesus fulfilled it all. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to break this down and look at to be able to see how Jesus fulfilled it all, to see what are these false places of confidence that can apply to us today and what is our true place of confidence. But the first thing I want to do is see how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. He fulfilled the Old Testament law. It had a purpose, but the purpose was to point to him. Okay? We can't ever say, I reject the Old Testament. No, we need the Old Testament because honestly, the Old Testament points to God's plan from the beginning, which was Jesus. But we have to see that now Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father. And through Jesus, we alone can be right with God. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18. This is what Jesus said about the Old Testament law, law that God gave his people through Moses. This is what he says about it. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Another translation says he did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. At the beginning of April, we are going to have a Passover meal that everyone's invited to. I hope you can come. I hope we have 150 people. I don't know if Jane wants 150 people because that's a lot of lamb and horseradish and all the other fun stuff that's involved in it. But all of that, the Old Testament, and specifically the Passover, points to Jesus, the Passover lamb. If we look at the Old Testament and we miss Jesus, then we've missed God's plan to save us from the beginning. It is so amazing to see God's plan outlined, but the law of the Old Testament was incomplete. It was never meant to offer salvation. It was meant to point us to our need to be saved because we are sinners and point to the one who fulfilled that. And so Jesus said, I've come to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Praise God for the Passover lamb, our Messiah, Savior, King, Jesus, the fulfillment of the law, the one in which we alone can be 
saved. So Paul is pleading to this church, don't go back to the law. The law was never intended to be for your salvation. Don't go back to the rules and rituals of the Jewish faith because they were pointing to Jesus and you cannot say, I am going to work my way to God, but I still want Jesus. No, Jesus did the work. Jesus did the work. Let's start with what Paul says where he is exposing these false places of confidence. Because that's what this group was doing. They were called Judaizers. They were Jewish converts. They were Gentiles, and they converted to the Jewish faith. And they were saying, Jesus is Savior, but yeah, you still need to obey everything about the law. No, Jesus fulfilled the law. And Paul is saying, whoa, whoa, all these things are false confidence. These are false places to put your trust and your hope of redemption in. It is only through Jesus. The first place... False confidence. Paul says here, we put in, in verse three, we put no confidence in human effort. And this is where he is going to go down and expose each of these places that these false teachers were saying that they needed to go back to the Jewish law. And again, this can apply to us today. And I hope you can see that. The first thing that he exposes is this. We are not to put our confidence in a ritual. We're not to put our confidence in a ritual. These false teachers were coming and saying, you have to obey all of the rituals of the Old Testament law. And that's the only way you can be right with God. And Paul is saying, no, salvation does not come through what we do, but through what Jesus did on the cross. That all of it was pointing to the reality of Jesus. This is what Paul said in Colossians 2.17. For these rules, all the Old Testament law, the rituals and rules in the Old Testament, these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. Well, what was the reality? What was it pointing to? And Christ himself is that reality. Now, we can get caught up in a lot of religious things. There are a lot of people who are religious, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. There are a lot of people that go to church and church is a religion. It's what they do and it's not a relationship, which is about what Jesus has done. Now, I'm not saying that we push aside all of those religious things. I'm not saying that we push aside the things that are outlined in Scripture. No, we need to do the things that are outlined in Scripture, but we need to do them for Jesus because it's all about Jesus. Those things don't save you. Jesus saves you. That is what Paul is revealing, and that is what we need to be reminded of. So the second thing that he says is we are not to put our confidence in our ethnicity, okay? You are not born from your parents into salvation. You must choose to receive what Jesus has done for you. You are not saved by your parents' or grandparents' faith. You are saved by your faith. And see, these Judaizers were saying, oh no, we convert, we've converted into Judaism, so really that's where our salvation comes. And Paul's like, wait a minute, I was born a Jew, you weren't. If anybody has any reason to hang their hat on the fulfillment of the law, I do. He said, but I have learned that that means nothing because Jesus is the only thing that matters. So many times people want to base their value and worth based upon some ethnicity or some heritage or something that has come from their ancestry. And Paul says, those things can have value, but the greatest value and what results in salvation is being a child of God through Jesus Christ. That's what matters. All those other things don't even compare to your identity in Jesus. You see, if our young people and young people here, and if I would have known this growing up, see, to me, growing up, it was all about having the mullet and, and having the muscles and, and being able to go and touch the backboard because I wasn't quite tall enough and being able to do all the moves of Michael Jordan. That was all of my, that was my pursuit and all of those things I wanted to be, but I realized that all those mean nothing compared to my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And so to understand, Paul is saying, your identity is not in what you do, what you look like, and how much muscle you have, or how much you look like someone on a magazine. Your identity, your value, and worth is who you are in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share that. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The reason why it says sons, that means heir. That means heir. In Bible time, if you're a firstborn son, you are an heir to all that the Father had. We are sons, which means heirs of all that God has promised. And so he goes on and says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So when we give our life to Jesus Christ, God does not see us without seeing Jesus. We are clothed with the redemption of Jesus Christ. And so then he goes on and he's saying all these things that everybody back then put all their value and worth in, all these things that they made their identity, that these things are present in your life, but they are not the value for eternity. They are not what save you. And he goes on and he says, there in Christ is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. They were still those things, but that wasn't their identity. Jesus was. They were still those things, but that was not their value and worth. That is not what made them right. Jesus did. And then he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You are part of the promise. God's plan from the beginning, the Old Testament pointed to those who would be an heir, inherit the kingdom of God, and that is through Jesus. Heirs according to the promise. So we cannot place our value in anything except who we are in Jesus Christ. That is huge. That is huge. Third, Paul reveals that we are not to put our confidence in our rank. We are not to put our confidence in our rank. So many people today to try to try to elevate themselves and put others down by rank or position. For example, just because you're a boss or an owner of something does not give you more value and does not give you the right to mistreat or disrespect someone. In the kingdom of God, just because I am a minister, an evangelist of the gospel does not give me more value in the kingdom of God. Rank no, we are all children of God, and that is our value. And we all have a purpose. So many times people say, well, only the minister or the elder can do that. No, you are of the royal priesthood. You as well are called to lead others to Jesus, to walk along the broken and hurting, to point to the hope that we sang about, the living hope. It's not about a rank, a position, or title. It's about Jesus and what he's done. And again, Paul says, yeah, these Judaizers are saying that they've got all this Jewish rank and title. He's like, I was not only born a Jew, but fulfilled the Jewish law every day of my life. And I was from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the most respected tribes. He said, but none of that, none of that compares to a relationship with Jesus. Fourth, the fourth misplacement of confidence is this. We are not to put our confidence in tradition. Not to put our confidence in tradition. Now, I think most of you who are, have lived as long as I have or, or more, tradition can be good. We need to hold on to some traditions as long as they don't elevate above Jesus. As long as traditions do not impact our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I fulfilled every Jewish tradition and those did not save me. Those Jewish traditions did not give me an identity that was for eternity, did not give me a righteous place with God. And so we have to understand that traditions are good, but they cannot cloud Jesus in our relationship with him. The fifth false confidence that Paul points out is we are not to put our confidence in rule keeping. Rule keeping. Paul was a Pharisee. They were all about keeping the rules and they even created more rules upon rules upon rules. 
But Jesus called the Pharisees spiritually blind because they elevated the rules above God. Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides because they loved their rules more than they loved God. And Paul said, no. That relationship with Jesus is greater than any attempt to try to measure up. So many times, keeping rules, making rules becomes a measuring stick for righteousness instead of God's grace and love through Jesus Christ. But this is where I have to point out, and parents, in advance, you're welcome. Teachers, you're welcome. About what I'm ready to say. I'm not encouraging rule breaking. Okay? Not encouraging rule breaking. Rules, kids, young people, rules are good. They guide your character. They keep you and others safe. So I'm not saying don't obey rules. Yes, obey rules are there for a reason. But what I am saying, and this is what Paul is saying, is we can't ever get lost in rules that we lose our relationship with the one who died for us. Okay? That's Paul's point. So again, follow rules. It's a good thing. Ultimately, to build your character, not to steal your joy. Ultimately, to keep you safe, not to put you in a prison. Rules are there to guide you, but ultimately, we need to always prioritize our relationship with the one who set us free, Jesus. The last thing, we are not to put our confidence in our zeal, our zeal, our passion, our zeal. Our culture today embraces this mindset. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere and really believe it. That is a bunch of baloney. That is why our culture is so messed up. Everybody's saying, well, as long as you're passionate about it, let them believe whatever they want. No, truth is God. Truth is found in God's word, and that will never change. The culture doesn't define truth. God does. And so you can be zealous or passionate about something and be dead wrong. The Apostle Paul was so zealous about upholding the law and the rules of the Jewish faith that he was blind to the Savior and Messiah who died and came back to life. And he was persecuting the church in his zeal. His zeal was wrong because he missed Jesus. We can have zeal and passion, but may it always be through our relationship with Jesus. We can have zeal and passion, but it needs to always come through our faith and surrender to the one who alone can save us. Let me put this up for us. Salvation comes through Jesus alone. You're not saved by your passion or your zeal. It is through Jesus alone. All of this, I'm going to bring it to a close here. All of this reveals our true place of confidence. You cannot put your confidence in your effort and your ability and what you can do. Our true confidence is Jesus and what Jesus has done. That's what Paul has been pointing at, pointing to this whole way through Philippians. Yeah, our work is because God is working. What we do is in response to Jesus. Who we are is because of what Jesus has done. And I love how Paul says it, and he says it so powerfully and so beautifully, where he reveals that true confidence confidence in all his life, all the things he was pursuing, doesn't compare to now his relationship with Jesus. Verses 7 through 9, I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. He's saying everything in life doesn't compare 
to having a relationship with Jesus. And not just a head knowledge of Jesus, but having a heart knowledge, a relational live every day. I can't live without you, Jesus. Live every day saying, God, please through your spirit and through your word, help me to grow in my relationship with Jesus. This is a personal relationship with Jesus that no matter what we face in life, people can reject us, they can mistreat us, but it doesn't matter because all that matters is who we are in Jesus Christ. We can face sickness, hardship, trial, and yes, those things hurt and they are painful, but we have hope, and that hope is Jesus. Matter of fact, that word garbage where he says he counts everything else he used to pursue to be right with God, everything else he was zealous about, all of that is garbage. That that original Greek word is actually more accurately translated as dung. Thank you, boys, because we like talking about dung, okay? Everything else is like dung compared to Jesus. Everything. We need to understand that the only thing in life and in death that has any value for who we are and our salvation and our identity and our eternal inheritance is Jesus. And if we prioritize anything else above Jesus, then we are doing nothing but chasing after that which is empty. Now, your family is important, but love your family best by loving Jesus most. Your job's important. Do your job the best way possible by honoring Jesus in all you do. Taking care of your health, that is a good thing. But do that by, above all, prioritizing Jesus and growing your relationship with him. There are good things, but we need to never prioritize or forsake the God things. And the God thing is, above all, our relationship with Jesus. Whew. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Praise God. This is good. I, I can't emphasize it enough. Let me ask these questions and we'll finish with this. Where is your confidence? Where is your confidence? In whom are you trusting? If the answer today and tomorrow and the rest of your life is not Jesus, please come and talk to me or someone else. If you are pursuing having success or money or having your kids be the most successful athlete or business person. Those things are fine, but if you ever lose sight of Jesus, then you have lost your way and you are leading someone else the wrong way. I'm going to pray for us. Father God, thank you. Thank you that the power of Jesus forgives us, no matter what we've done. The power of Jesus changes us, no matter what path we've taken. And the power of Jesus takes the things in our life that are good and makes them of greater value because our relationship with Jesus is of greatest value. And I thank you, God, that so many of us were on a path going the wrong direction. Maybe not the same as Saul going to Damascus, but thank you, God, because of Jesus, you saved us on that path of destruction and you have given us now a new life where you love us through Jesus, you heal us through Jesus, you change us through Jesus. And thank you, God, that that work continues and thank you for the power of your grace that you will complete that which you have begun in us. So God, we have hope through Jesus and we praise you. We have a new identity and a new name through Jesus. And for God, God, if there's anyone today that is outside of Christ and the weight of their sin and that eternal punishment is upon them, God, may they feel the tug of their heart where you are drawing them to you to be your child, forgiven and set free to be yours in this life and for eternity. All of this, God, all of this, God, we praise you through Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.